if I could have your attention while you continue to eat, uh, it's great to see such a strong turnout for our brown bag lunch conversation today. I think it's a tribute to Ellen um, and the work that she's done on our campus. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Ed Steinmetz, Senior Vice President for Finance. And again, I welcome all of you here today. Before I proceed with the introduction, uh, I would like to take maybe uh, 30 seconds just in a moment of silence. As we plan for this, uh, one of our colleagues, Ray Bird, was very instrumental in working with Ellen on framing the conversation and what we were trying to do with these brown bag sessions. And, and all of you, I think, are aware of our Ray's tragic passing over the holiday break. So if we could just take a minute in your own way to, to remember Ray and his contributions. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, with that, I'll proceed. Uh, as many of you know, Ellen Miller Casey, PhD, faculty emerita, received her BS from Loyola University Chicago, an MA from the University of Iowa, and a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. When she arrived at the university back in 1969, she was one of just three female faculty members teaching at what was then an all-male institution. Even after her two female colleagues left the university, uh, Ellen was too focused on her teaching to feel out of place and continue to do her good work on campus. During the course of her career at the university, Ellen has served uh, on several terms on the faculty senate, including one term as chair. She was a member of the Women's Studies program and served on the handbook committee from its inception. I think as many of you are aware, Ellen has been very active with middle states and served two terms as the Middle States Commissioner after chairing the university's Middle States Report. From 1976 until her retirement in 2009, Ellen, an English and theater professor, took over an undergraduate honors program in need of vision, <coughs> excuse me, and grew it from a small offering open to students in a handful of departments to a hallmark program available to students across all disciplines. On a personal level, uh, in the early 80s, I was one of those students in the program and as a commuter from South Scranton, and I remember having a, a cookout at Stephen Ellen's home and making some good friends that, that uh, to this day I remain close with, and, and it was a, a great program to be part of. Currently, Ellen serves on our 125th anniversary celebration committee and has been an active member of the committee, so it's my pleasure to introduce Ellen uh, for our conversation this afternoon. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Ed, and thank you for remembering Ray Bird. Uh, he was the one that asked me to do this, and as Ed said, he discussed with me what he wanted. I hope I please him. I also want to thank, for information of various and sundry kinds, three people, Joe Weatherall, Michael Friedman, and especially Kristen Yarmy. Um, when I had questions about exact dates or exact numbers, those were the people that provided it. Um, in 1888, St. Thomas College, an all-male school, was started by the Diocese of Scranton. Uh, in 1934, it's still identified in state documents as a college for the education of men. Um, that changed in 1938 when women were first admitted to the evening school. Uh, in order for that to happen, the diocese had to approve. We were still a diocesan college, though the Christian brothers were here staffing it, but it was not a Christian brothers college. It was a diocesan college with the Christian brothers as staff. Um, the diocese was reluctant because by then Marywood existed. Uh, St. Thomas finally convinced the bishop that there were many women who were thereby being excluded from having a Catholic education. And so in 1938, after a couple of years of back and forthing over this, uh, women were admitted. And those are the first women students admitted to the university. Um, there is a picture that Kristen found for me of the first graduating class from the evening college. Um, and there are, no, that's the graduate school. I've got the wrong picture. Wait, hold that one. 
Uh, <laughs> graduate school began in 1950. Uh, and that was from the beginning open to both women and men. And that photograph um, that exists in 1952, the first class of graduates from the graduate school, they got masters in education. Um, there were nine men and three women. Um, there are some women teaching in the 30s and 40s. Um, as best as I can tell, and I've done my best to find this out, they all seem to be what we would now call adjunct faculty. Um, they seem to have been part-time. None of them have any rank except instructor, and they keep that rank. I've been through a number of the handbooks, and Kristen has been through a number of the handbooks. They seem to keep that rank, you know, for five years, eight years, ten years. So quite clearly, I think, not permanent faculty, not tenure track faculty, but clearly in the classroom. Um, the earliest that I've been able to find were Lenore Philbin, an instructor in speech, who arrived in 1938, Margaret Durkin, an instructor in English, who arrived in 1942, and Eleanor Rozajewski, later Krajewski, an instructor in Polish, who arrived in 1945. Um, there were also librarians. Um, the earliest that I've been able to find is M. Dorothy Lynn, who came in 1937 as a reference librarian. And Concetta Rao came in 1941, first as a secretary to the university librarian Eugene Wilging, and then named assistant to the librarian. Um, by 1941, Shortly, she is then assistant reference librarian. Uh, both of those women had bachelor's degrees in library from Marywood. Um, kind of signs of the times, they were also both much admired by the male students. Um, Dorothy Lynn was runner-up for university sweetheart <laughs> in 1940. She came in second to Miss Pauline Casey, no relative, who was prominent in diocesan circles. Um, Concetta Rao's arrival was trumpeted in the Aquinas. There was an article on her arrival. The headline was, New Librarian Takes Over, Watch That Thermometer. And a sign of the times on campus is this quotation, from the Aquinas' Tommy Rot column, um, a couple of years later. Cupid stole the march on the U students this week when two sweethearts of the university, namely Miss Anella Wallace, secretary to Mr. Wilging, and Miss Concetta Rao, night librarian, each came to school displaying a ring on the third finger left hand. Miss Wallace claims that Miss Rao will certainly beat her to the altar as her bow has to win a war first. However, Miss Rao still denies that there is anything serious about it. We wonder. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't think times have changed, I think that paragraph tells you a lot. Um, there were some more librarians who arrived after uh, the Second World War um, and who stayed for a long time. Uh, a long time, that is, they were still here when I came, and they stayed for a while after that. Uh, notably, Marianne McTighe, who arrived in 1945. She later served as director of the library. Mildred Norton, who came in 1946. Angelina Scardamaglia, who came in 1947. And then in the 1950s, uh, Helen Kelly arrived, and those four stayed. And they received faculty rank in 1967. Um, Father Hanley said that he gave these little old ladies in tennis shoes faculty rank rather than pay. It was cheaper to give them faculty rank than it was to pay them more money. Um, I'm not sure he was joking. <laughs> When the faculty was working on unionization in the early 70s, um, 
there were two disputes about faculty to be included. One was the athletic faculty, and the other were the librarians, at, who at that point were all women. Uh, the administration said, no, 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 they weren't faculty. The faculty representative said, yes, 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 they were. Um, when unionization finally occurred um, in the 1974-75 academic year, um, the NLRB sided with the faculty and those women and those people teaching in the athletic department received not only faculty rank but also faculty status and became part of the bargaining union and they have been ever since. Um, but it was not until 1969 that full-time tenure-track women were hired. So there were women that were in the classroom, uh, all of them, and I'm like 95% certain of this. I don't absolutely guarantee it that, they, that none of them were tenure-track, but I can find no evidence that they were tenure-track, and every evidence it, indicates that at the least they weren't tenure track and probably weren't full time. But that's not absolutely clear. But in any case, I am quite certain, certainly was told, and the evidence seems to support, that in 1969, three women were hired as permanent tenure track faculty, teaching faculty. Obviously by then, um, the librarians had faculty status, though they weren't, from the administration's point of view, officially faculty yet. But the three of us who were hired in 69 were clearly, and at least to my sense unambiguously, uh, a member of the regular faculty. And those three women were Teresa McGlinchey, who was hired in the theology department, Sister Alice Louise Davis, RSM, who was hired as a professor of education, and me, who was hired as an assistant professor in the English department. I don't know how deliberate this was, that three women were hired that year. Um, I do know that at that time, there was just looking at who was hired immediately before and when we were hired, there was a move generally to hire more people who did not, who hadn't graduated from the U, who weren't local, who hadn't graduated from King's. So there, there seems to have been, the, by numbers, it would suggest that there was a deliberate plan to expand the faculty. But I don't know whether it was plan or accident, just as I don't know whether the three women hired that year was plan or accident. I know that mine was somewhat accidental. I know how I came to be here. Um, my husband Stephen got an interview in the theology department, and so I wrote letters to all of the colleges in the area saying, I might be moving to Scranton. Would you have a job for a PhD in English with a 19th specialty in 19th century British literature? And the only one I heard from, now I guess I got one negative from, I think, Misery, um, but the U wrote and said, yeah why don't you come with your husband and be interviewed? So I said yes. Um, there were, by the way, no laws at that time about the need to advertise a position. If you had a job, you could hire whoever you wanted. There were no affirmative action laws. None of that stuff had happened in the larger society. Um, and I later found out that the reason that the chair of English said, yeah, come along, was that the man who had been teaching 19th century British literature had decided that he was worth more money. And when he got his contract, he said, you give me more money or I leave. And Steve Ryan said to him, so I hear, goodbye and good luck, we're so sorry. <laughs> and the faculty member was rather stuck, having been out, rather outrageous, as I heard. I met the man casually after that and never brought up this topic, <laughs> needless to say. <laughs> but having been rather outrageous about this and insisting that he deserved more money, and unless he got it, he was leaving, they took him up on it. Uh, 
just in general. I know at least one other story in which someone did that. Be very, very careful <laughs> of ever saying, if, act, if not X, then I leave, because goodbye and good luck may be what you get. So make sure you're willing to go. Um, I later learned that Steve Ryan, who was chair of English, was, had been very active in civil rights um, down in New Orleans before he came here. Um, and I do know that Steve suggested to me after I had been hired that he thought it was going to be a good thing that this male bastion had some women in it. And he went on to say, and I'm not just talking about the students. Um, but in any case, Terry taught one year and then left. Alice Louise taught two years and then left. So in 1971-72, I was the only full-time woman. There were women teaching adjunct in various things. Um, and I was also pregnant with our third child. Now, some context for that at the time, larger context. Firing someone because they, was pre they were pregnant uh, was not illegal, nor was it uncommon. Um, and there was no such thing as maternity leave. That, those laws did not exist at that point. And though I had been hired, when I came for my interview, I was seven months pregnant with our second child. Um, in my previous teaching job, in an all-women's college, I had decided that I needed to leave to finish my dissertation and take care of our child. And I was told by the nun who chaired the department that it was good that I was resigning because they would have let me go in any case. We had a pregnant faculty member once and it didn't work out. <laughs> so it was a bit different to be a mother and, a, and another thing to be pregnant. And why I might think about that, um, what relaxed me finally that January when it was becoming clear that I needed, I was either going to verbally announce it or people were going to know in any case that I was pregnant. Uh, I was on a middle states committee. Um, the vi then vice president, Father Joseph Rock, uh, was chairing the committee on administration, which in itself is an interesting thought. Um, and there had been a meeting in January, and I had come in for it. And after the meeting, the chair of the chemistry department came up to Father Rock to say, Father Rock, we have a problem. So I'm getting my stuff to leave. Everyone else had gone, and I said, you know, I'm, I better leave. This is confidential. And he says, Father Rock says, what's the problem? Um, and Umbe said, our graduate assistant is pregnant. Well, I dropped my gloves. I couldn't find my coat. Oh, listen, there was no way I was walking out of that room. If they were willing to talk about it, I was more than willing to listen. So anyway, Umbe and Joe Rock go back and forth with Father Rock saying, what's the problem? And Umbe saying, she's pregnant. And Father Rock saying, what's the problem? And I'm, literally, uh, this back and forth happened. So Father Rock is trying to get it off this tennis match, says, is there a problem with the chemicals she's using? And Ambe says, well, yes, there is, but we've taken care of that. What's the problem? She's pregnant. And it became clear that for Ambe, the presence of a pregnant woman in the classroom was in and of itself a problem. And Father Rock said, motherhood is a high and holy calling, and we will do whatever we can to accommodate her. Uh, paternalism gets a bum rap often, but paternalism can also do very good things. Um, so I breathed, um, and in any case, Paul was born in mid-August, um, three weeks before classes began. That was not a good semester for me, but that's another tale. <laughs> How much, I felt very visible as the, you know, one of the very few women on campus is, and, you know, getting more and more pregnant every day. Um, I did wonder, however, I was on campus just before classes began, probably a week before classes began, ran into Tom Garrett, who was congratulating me on the birth of our son, and another faculty member came up and Tom explained that he was congratulating me on the birth of our son. 
Um, and the faculty member said, oh, me no think you pregnant, me just think you fat. <laughs> and those of you who have been here a while would recognize who I'm quoting, but I'll <laughs> leave it at that. Uh, so I don't know how visible I in fact was. <laughs> Um, in many ways, the U was ahead of the times. Um, it was common practice at the t point we were hired that if two faculty members at a school married, they'd fire the woman. They didn't fire one of them. The, the progressive places gave them a choice as to who quit. Most places just fired the woman. That was, that was how it went. And we had been hired already married to each other. And that was very unusual. In addition, Father Rock had promised us that the U would arrange our schedule so we weren't teaching at the same time so that we could take care of our kids. And the one semester when it didn't happen, at that we've gotten used to, or we did get used to certainly putting in at the least requests, if not demands, as to when we teach. Um, when we came, you got a schedule. Um, there was, if you could sweet talk someone, you might get a bit of preference, but basically you got a schedule. And one year they gave us identical schedules, and they were wonderful schedules, except they were identical. So we went to Father Rock, well, Stephen went to Father Rock, and it got fixed. <laughs> um, at about that time, I had been at a Modern Language Association meeting um, in New York. They had a section on two career couples, and I went. And after listening to a whole lot of horror tales, women that had been fired and various and sundry things, um, I told the story of our situation and was asked where this e idyllic place was. <laughs> Nonetheless, women faculty members were unexpected. Um, Non-university people had no idea that this was. Two quick stories. Fo we did not have phones on our desks. Faculty phones were in the hall around clusters of offices, and so you kind of had to decide who was going to answer. And if you were in a good little pod, you shared it out, or if you were expecting a call, you went and got it. But people outside the U had no idea that this would exist. It was uh, more than a bit weird. And the presumption always, when I answered the phone, was I was, of course, a secretary. Mm -hmm. So I got asked one day where Professor Cullither was. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know. His door says he will be in at 3 o'clock. What do you mean you don't know? That's your job to know. So I explained, though, it wasn't, in fact, my job to know. Um, and then there was the, the book salesman. I could see him coming down the hall, checking his list, checking signs, sticks his head in my door and goes, Dr. Casey? <laughs> it was the same one who had gone to the theology department, stuck his head in Stephen's door and said, Father Casey? <laughs> Stephen told him he was a father, but not the kind he was expecting. <laughs> um, students, by and large, presumed I was part-time, uh, tended to use Mrs. instead of Dr. That went on for a long time. Rebecca Beale came to the English department in 1983. And she was still Mrs. Beale. She said it was very curious. She said, since there wasn't any such person except her mother, uh, <laughs> I see heads nodding as that probably hasn't totally disappeared. Yes. Um, once I got an obscene comment on my Britain on my door, came in early morning. Um, and I have to say less about the obscene comment than what happened. I called maintenance and told them what it was. I came back from my 8 o'clock class. My door was pristine. No one ever said anything. They took care of it. Um, and in general, the maintenance and staff people were very good. There was one maintenance man whom we all called Doc because he called all the faculty Doc. <laughs> and unlike our students who were inclined to call me Mrs., I was always Doc with no questions asked. Um, fellow faculty were a mixed bag. Um, some were hostile. Um, one story, I had a chair gone a long time um, who insisted on calling everyone in our, we had a department meeting and everyone was Dr. Casey, not Dr. Casey, 
Dr. McNerney, Father, Reverend Father Quinn, esteemed Professor Colather. So if you didn't have doctor, then you got an adjective. Um, and I was Mrs. Casey. So I went to see him in his office to explain, A, I didn't think we needed titles used in department meetings, and B, if we were going to use them, I was Dr. Casey. Oh, of course. Next meeting, I was Mrs. Casey again. So I repeated my spiel in the department. It never happened again. Uh, some faculty had problems, had difficulties figuring out how to deal with a woman as an equal, but that's probably not surprising. They had, most of them had no women faculty in their undergraduate or graduate. How do I know this? In my undergraduate and graduate years, I had one woman faculty member, and she was a graduate student teaching part-time. So it was hardly surprising that for my fellow faculty, they hadn't thought about how, how does it work. Um, and that was also true probably when they got home. We once had a meeting, had a day off because we had some outside advisors and it was a day-long workshop. And then it ended with a happy hour to which spouses were invited. And so one of the wives of a faculty member was talking about how awful it had been that Sam's, not his name, that Sam always took Friday to work at home and this had been interrupted and how awful it was. And so I said something like, well, but it was a good workshop. It was worth the time. She said, you were here? You're teaching? I said, yes. She said, how wonderful of you to be able to get out of the house. <laughs> so times were different. They were different for men. They were different for women. Um, the women's staff were also working to achieve equality. I got involved peripherally in one of their fights. They had decided they were tired of the dress code, which said that staff, women's staff had to wear skirts. And so they, that was never in, I have no idea whether that was the dress code for women faculty. No one ever told me. And I never did it, you know, I, I just ignored it. But for the women's staff, it was most, it was very clear. So one of the secretaries saw me and said, you know, next Wednesday we are all wearing slacks. Would you please? He said, I know you do sometimes, but would you please on that day? And I said, of course, did. There was a fair amount of sputtering and yelling, <laughs> but bottom line, no one got fired and the women from then on wore whatever they wanted. <laughs> I used to say I would believe we were fully integrated when we had a woman faculty member in Loyola Hall. Um, Dr. Christine McDermott arrived in 1979 in the biology department. When, and there is now at least one woman in every department except computing sciences, but all the others have at least one. But then there are no men in nursing, so I guess it comes out even. Um, second, my second requirement was that we needed a woman administrator. Uh, Sister Catherine McNamee, CSJ, became dean of Dexter Hanley College in 1984 and she was succeeded by Dr. Shirley Adams in 1986. And when the faculty lounge was no longer a men's room, that one got solved by getting rid of the lounge. Uh, <laughs> but at least it was no longer a men's room. Um, in the 70s, there was rather a revolving door for women. Of the women that came in that decade, only four stayed. Uh, Dr. Midori Rin, who came in 75, Sister Jane Copas, who came in 78, and Chris McDermott and Dr. Deborah Goodgen, who came in 79. Um, there were others, but they'd come a year, two years, leave for various and sundry reasons. In any case, the percentage of women faculty has steadily grown. Um, these numbers are based on my count in catalogs, but who we put in catalogs was not always totally consistent, so take these as approximation. Um, in 1969, there were seven, the four librarians and the three teaching faculty, 5%, seven of 130. By 1979, there were 14 of 163, 8.5%. By 1989, 56 of 243, 23%. By 1999, 78 of 248, 31%. By 2009, 
105 of 266, or 39 percent. And my count in the 213-14 catalog is 110 of 282, which is also 39 percent. I checked with Michael Friedman um, because who's on that list varies, and he checked facts list, and he came up slightly different number, but essentially the same percentage, 116 of 290, or 40 percent. So the so essentially they're of the faculty. 40% uh, are women at the moment, and that has been true now for about five years. Uh, it goes without saying, of course, that we needed women students as well as women faculty. Um, there were women in the evening school and the graduate school, and there were occasional women in day classes. E women going to, students going to the evening school could attend day classes with permission. A number of them did, and some of them were women. Uh, and there also was a program in which we were offering college credit to high school students. So we had some students from Central um, who were in our classes. Um, and in 69, the discussion of admitting women was under discussion. So that was underway already um, with, I think, two reasons so far as I could get, although I was not involved in this discussion. One is it's a good thing to do, and two, we badly need students. We had truck drivers living in one of the dormitories, which helped convince us that students of any kind would be useful. Um, <laughs> so in 1970, the university approved the admission of women. There had been some yelling and screaming, I gather, but they approved it. Um, one of the resistances was because Mary Wood was there and was all women. There were a couple of years in which there was an attempt, well, there was, there, in which there was a cooperative program. Uh, didn't succeed horribly well. Uh, and in 1972, the university was the last Jesuit university to admit women. 58 women were admitted to that class, and Fitch Hall was remodeled uh, so that they had, as a women's dormitory. Um, ironically, that same year, Scranton Prep became the first Jesuit prep school to admit girls. So we were last and first simultaneously. Um, by 1989, women made up 50 percent of the day school enrollment. By 1992, more women than men graduated. Um, the current undergraduate day schools are 55 percent women. Thank you, Joe Weatherall. Um, there have been some additions to the university because of that explicitly in response. Uh, the nursing major was a direct attempt to recruit women and serve women. Um, the women's studies concentration obviously designed with them in mind and the Jane Copas <laughs> Women's Center um, organized. There were other things, but those three large ones. Um, when I came, the faculty handbook said that in order to be tenured, one needed to be, this is a quote, a Christian gentleman. <laughs> that had not, to be fair to the university, that had not stopped them from tenuring Marty Appleton in the chemistry department, good Jew that he was. <laughs> uh, Marty and I used to both mock that requirement. Um, by the time I came up from tenure, it was no longer a requirement. Uh, and I would suggest that the U is a richer place. Uh, much as I might like that Newman-esque requirement, um, I think it's a richer place for the diversity of its faculty and its students. Thank you. I know people probably have to leave, at least some of you, but I'll be glad to take questions if anyone has any. Yeah. Not as I understood it, no, because I taught some of them, so they would be a variety of majors. Not all majors were offered in evening school, which is how you'd get some people in day school. You didn't have every major offered, so if you wanted to major in some things, you had to go to day school. But no, they weren't, they weren't herded into or limited. They could major in whatever there was to be majored in. Yeah? 
comments? Did I get it right? <laughs> <laughs> Kristen. How far do we have left to go? How, how do you see the status of women on campus now in view of, of the whole law history? I think the status of women is pretty good. Um, there are always, just as there were then, there are outside pressures. I mean, I think, for instance, one of the large issues at large, not just at the U, is we have 55% women students. Nationally, it's going on 60%. And I think that much as I'd like to see women getting opportunities and taking advantage of those, I think societally, um, I don't want to see it go the other way so that women go to college and men don't. So I think the, I think trying to achieve a balance, I mean, we're, you know, we have more men than the average. So I think we always exist in, in a larger context. But on campus, yeah, we need more women, we need more people going to the women's basketball games, but, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think we're doing pretty well. We, we have had a woman provost, we haven't yet had a woman president, but then we haven't yet had a non-Jesuit president, so. Yeah, Betsy. Ellen, um, when I was perusing through the catalogs yesterday, um, I noticed the change in the Board of Trustees, because at one time, most of the Board of Trustees members were Jesuits. Yes. Um, do you have any sense of how the placement of women now on the Board of Trustees is helping us transition to better um, relationships between the sexes? I don't know explicitly. I do know some women that have, have served and are serving on the Board of Trustees, and I can't imagine that they don't speak up. So certainly the women <laughs> trustees that I've known, largely women who had been here as students, and I had known them then, uh, but the women trustees that I know, I'm sure keep their eyes open and talk when they feel the need. But more specific than that, I don't really know. Yeah. Uh, on that point, I think it's interesting that I think two of the women from that first class have served on the board. Yes. Susan Swain and uh, Karen, Karen Pennington. Pennington. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah. Neither one of which would keep their mouth shut if they saw a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I had both of them as students. <laughs> okay. Thank you.